serving it up to you live on the Buffalo Rumblings Vidcast Network. I'm Bruce Nolan. Nate Geary's not here. And this is Food for Thought. Ladies and gentlemen, the Buffalo Bills defeated the Detroit Lions in the first preseason game of 2021 with a thrilling last second field goal by kicker Tyler Bass. And I got to be honest, this is a little bit different for me. I'm not really used to this role. Those of you who have followed my pod for a while will know that it's not really what I do. The whole post-game pod thing, not really my thing. It's not really part of the brand, but it's a little awkward for me. It's awkward for me. Usually my show happens after the All-22 has already dropped. And because of that, I can be much more confident in the takes that I have. I can feel good about it. I can say, okay, you know what? I feel confident that I am right about these takes. Usually there's a few players I can focus in on and I can think to myself, okay, I can walk away with three or four really strong observations and I can build a pod around that. However, today is not one of those days. Sometimes you got to do things that are uncomfortable. You need a growth mindset, ladies and gentlemen, and that is what I'm going to try to have today. Before we even get started, one of the things I think is interesting is that you're going to see a lot of fairly extreme takes that come out of the first preseason game because you always do. So I want to warn you against myself or anybody else having a pretty extreme preseason take based on what you just saw. The reason that is, is because fans are always going to rate preseason games more than I think coaches do. And it's real simple why that is. It happens that way because of the visibility of games versus the visibility of practices. For coaches, the preseason game is just one part of the puzzle, and they see the whole thing. We see markedly less of the puzzle as fans. We see way less of the puzzle because even the observations that we get from practice come with limited video. It comes with limited availability of data. It comes with limited limited observations. All of these things are hindering us from being able to get the full picture. We don't get to have the full picture, but the coaches do. So let's check in. If you're here in the comments with me, hit me up, say hi in the comments. Let me know how the audio levels are going. Let me know if you can hear me okay. Make sure that you are following me on on Twitter at Bruce Exclusive. I do my best to tweet out as much as I possibly can. Bring a smile to your face during the game. Let's go through some observations. Let's go through some observations. The first thing that I want to talk about is the wide receiver battle. The wide receiver battle was always going to be a hot topic coming in because not just is it, hey, are they going to keep six or seven? But also there are some people at the bottom of the roster that make you think, okay, maybe there's some interesting names. It's not just competition because you don't have anyone good. One of the reasons why preseason was so much fun for a lot of Bills fans during the drought drought era is because the team wasn't good enough for you to have a lot of roster locks. But when you have a wide receiver core that has Stephon Diggs and Cole Beasley and Gabriel Davis and Emmanuel Sanders as the top four, Isaiah McKenzie, who I believe is basically a roster lock, then you have five people already set in stone. You're not trying to decide four positions. You're trying to decide one, maybe two. This is a lot different than what Bills fans are used to going through during the drought era in preseason. When you have a team that is this good and they play a preseason game, it's different Because I actually think you can focus more. You can focus more because there's less battles. There's less interesting players 
because you have more locks. You have more sure things. You have more known quantities. You have a starting quarterback who doesn't take a snap in a preseason game, not due to injury, but because we already know what we have, and he has $258 million. So that right there is very, very different. So the wide receiver battle is one of those things going into this particular situation that you got to keep an eye on. McKenzie, Hodgins, Stevenson. A couple notes on McKenzie. He dropped a low pass on uh, in breaking route, but the turf monster got him a kick return. Now, if you watch McKenzie on that angle route that he dropped, it was a low pass. But then you watch Brandon Powell. Go back and watch this game. Watch Isaiah McKenzie on that angle route and then watch Brandon Powell on that exact same angle route. Sometimes I think we float over certain terms when we're talking and don't really actually show you on video what that looks like. When someone says route running, a lot of times it will help you to watch the same route run by different receivers. It can help you digest who's actually a quote unquote better route runner. Watch Isaiah McKenzie run that angle route and then watch Brandon Powell do the same thing. Watch the false steps by Powell in that angle route and be very, very, very clear that there is a significant gap between these two players. I made sure to make a note on that. Hodgins' ability to get separation on a crosser, which is good. I was, I was happy with it. But then he became out with a knee injury. So that's going to be something to monitor because anytime you lose ground due to lost time, that matters. Stevenson completely raised the ball on kick returns, had the short catch on offense, but then big catch down the sideline. One of the things I think is interesting about Stevenson is a lot of people had Stevenson v. McKenzie. Stevenson v. McKenzie was a discussion. I think it was about returner, but if you look at the way that they're employed on offense, it is markedly different. Stevenson was playing outside receiver. Isaiah McKenzie was playing the slot. So I think one of the things that we need to talk about, if we're going to make the whole Stevenson versus McKenzie thing, if we're going to make that a thing, which I don't think is really a thing. I think McKenzie's going to make this team regardless, but if you're going to make it a thing, understand that They play different positions on offense. McKenzie played in the slot. Stevenson played on the outside. They're very, very differently deployed on offense. So if you'd like to make it a thing on special teams, you're welcome to. Although Stevenson did not return a punt. You're welcome to do that on special teams. But on offense, they're deployed very, very differently. So don't equate the two of them as far as Yuches goes on offense. Let's talk about running backs. Running backs at the bottom of the roster. Antonio Williams runs hard, runs real hard. You can tell this is a guy who consistently runs angry. Fumbled on the way down with one of his carries. Got hurt with a stinger, but came back. Matt Breida, I thought he was fine. I thought Matt Breida was fine. I did not see this explosiveness that other people talk about with Matt Breida. I did not see the same level of explosiveness that I see from him in previous stints with San Francisco. And one of the things to discuss about Matt Breida is that maybe that long speed, that 438 long speed is really a second 20 and not a first 20. So it'll be interesting to see Breida again moving forward, but I thought he was, he was okay. One of the things I thought was interesting is Reggie Gilliam is listed as the only fullback on the roster. And I thought that was a little interesting because I think that whether or not you have someone like that make the roster is not necessarily based on whether or not you're going to keep a fullback. Because obviously, if you're going to keep a fullback, you have to keep the only one you have on the roster. (laughs) That makes complete sense. However, one of the discussions was, can you use Jacob Hollister in that role? Can you use Dawson Knox in that role? I did not see either one of them used in that role. So that's a point of note. You are listening to me live on the Buffalo Rumblings Vidcast Network. You are listening to Food for Thought. I am flying solo this Friday evening. My normal co-host, Nate Geary, is not with me. If you are listening to me on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, I appreciate you joining in. You're getting cold, hard facts, fresh, hot takes, 
Don't forget to tip your servers. YouTube Super Chats get priority. So let's move on to the offensive line. The offensive line, Spencer Brown has some John Feliciano in him. A little bit of that energy, a little bit of that grit. I was really happy with what I saw from Spencer Brown overall. I think that's one of the things that we have a tendency to do as football fans is we associate athleticism with pass blocking. We associate athleticism with ability to stay on your toes and be agile and quick-footed in pass protection. We do not necessarily associate athleticism with run blocking, but we should. When you watch Spencer Brown on down blocks, his ability to use length and foot speed to collapse down, that matters, and it's noticeable. I noticed it and wrote it down in my 400 pages of notes that I'm going to try to slim down into a few minutes of this podcast. But I was happy with Spencer Brown. On the inverse, Tommy Doyle, although a similar level of tested athlete, was very, very different today. Tommy Doyle right now did not play at the same level as Spencer Brown. Tommy Doyle at right tackle was almost as ineffective as Bobby Hart was at left tackle. Now, obviously, one of those is a lot more forgivable because one of those is a rookie coming from Miami of Ohio. The other is a vet offensive lineman who, to be fair, has essentially never been an overly effective football player and the American Football League. American Football League. (laughs) Um, I'm taking it back to the 1950s now. The National Football League. So Bobby Hart was bad. Bobby Hart was absolutely bad. Mr. Heisenberg says, when are we going to talk about Tyler Bass's bulge? Tyler Bass, absolutely all of the ice in his vein, all of the iron testicular fortitude, all of it. Loved it. Love to see it. Heisenberg, thanks for being a part of it, man. I appreciate that. Now, there's a discussion about guards as well as tackles that we need to talk about. I was specifically looking at Cody Ford and Ike Butker. Not a lot of observations when it comes to Ike Butker, but Cody Ford, I thought, did a really good job of locating contact in space on pullings. When he was pulling, I think he did a good job. He's better on pull runs than in zone. I don't think this is a shocker to anybody, but one of the big talking points this particular offseason was the zone blocking scheme and the pin and pull. Those two competing concepts. Cody Ford, I thought, did a really nice job of being able to break Matt Breida on a good run. In addition, when he was pulling, I thought he did a really good job locating locating contact. In zone, let some people cross his face a couple times. But him still being in at the end of half sequence was probably a good thing for him to get a couple extra reps. The next one that I want to talk about, and the one that is probably the topic of the game as far as topic du jours go. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the youth on the defensive line. I think the last year we came into this year, this, this year and we thought, hey, we thought we were going to see certain things from the Bills defensive line. We thought we were going to see an uptick in production. Brought in Mario Addison, drafted AJ Epinesa, Quentin Jefferson. We thought we were going to see a certain thing. Padden says, Bruce doing his favorite thing. Live reaction solo pod. (laughs) Great work. Padden, I appreciate that, man. This is not my thing. These are all the things I don't like doing together. Solo, live, (laughs) post-game. This is all of my least favorite things. All of my least favorite things all at once. Thanks so much for being a part of it, Padden. I really appreciate that. So let's talk about the youth on the defensive line because we thought it was going to look a certain way. We thought Quentin Jefferson, Mario Addison, A.J. Epinesa, totally different. I think the 2021 Bills line has a chance to be what I thought I was going to see from the 2020 Bills line. I'll tell you what I mean by that. At the end of the half, when Detroit was in the two-minute drill, what did you see on the Bills defensive line? Rousseau, Obata, Basham, Epinesa. Quick side note, the Bills public relations, when they tweeted out that the Bills had signed F.A. Obata, 
They specifically said it was pronounced F.A. Obara. And if you've listened to my pod previously, that's the way I've been pronouncing it. I have been pronouncing it F.A. Obara because that's the way it was emphasized on the Bills public relations tweet. And I figured they know better than anyone. Sal Capaccio got with me from WGR and specifically said, hey, just so you know, we got with Bill's PR. That was a mistake. It is actually pronounced F.A. Obata. So I'm going to try to unlearn what I just learned over the last couple of months and start calling him F.A. Obata. But the Bills had Rousseau, Obata, Basham, Epinesa on the line at the same time. A lot of people hear this. You talk about NASCAR packages with all four defensive ends, Lambo packages, whatever it is you want to call them. They're the ones that stuffed the fourth down. So that was interesting. Just from a qualitative stylistic standpoint, that's interesting. Having four defensive ends. Because I thought that's what you were going to say. see a little bit from Quentin Jefferson in 2020. And it just didn't materialize. Ended up playing a lot of one tech. Gregory Rousseau versus Penne Sewell was something I was really looking forward to seeing, not just because they're both first round picks. If you remember some of the discussion about Penne Sewell leading up to the draft, it was all oh, man, slam dunk, slam dunk. And then all of a sudden they start to nitpick a little bit. And what was the thing they nitpicked, nitpicked about Penne Sewell? If you know in the comments, what was the trait they nitpicked about Penne Sewell? Go ahead and put that in there before I spoil it for you. But I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you right now. It was his length. There were some, hey, I don't know about the arm length. What's the big trait that you see from Gregory Rousseau that one of the reasons it causes him to be named Groot? It's the length. It showed up. If you would like to see why length matters, make sure you're watching the replay of Gregory Rousseau on Penne Sewell. That's why length matters. Length matters. However, this is something we should talk about. Length is good. Length plus get off is better. So one of the things that get off allows you to do is allows you to change angles and really make the margin for error for an offensive tackle a lot smaller. Because you're getting up on their toes so much faster. You're getting into the half-man relationship so much faster. If you have that and you have elite length, that becomes a problem. As far as I'm concerned, you couldn't really ask for a whole lot better of a circumstance for a first-round rookie than Gregory Rousseau. Coming into the draft, I was like, what do you do with Gregory Rousseau? What do you do with him? I thought maybe you bulk him up. You make him a five tech and you turn him into like an Eric Armstead style player. The bill said, no, I think he can be a four, three base defensive end. And through one game signs point to good things. Drago Knight one Oh one in with a super chat. So happy to listen live. Love the work, Bruce. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate you being a part of this. I appreciate all you being a part of. We have hundreds of people watching this live right now. Can't tell you how much I appreciate you being a part of it. I don't know. Maybe this post game thing is not so bad after all. I got to be honest. Everyone's being so nice. <laughs> maybe it's just because the Bills won. But one of the reasons why the Bills won is because they got really good productivity from the defensive line. And that's what we've been talking about. We talked about Gregory Rousseau. Let's talk about F.A. Obata. F.A. Obata looked really, really good. He was fluid, consistently rushing against the right tackle, but then also when he kicked inside. I think F.A. Obata has an opportunity to be for this defensive line in 2021 what I thought Quentin Jefferson was going to be for this defensive line in 2020. I was very excited when the Bills signed Quentin Jefferson. I thought he would give you that inside-outside versatility. I think he was the best pass rusher on the Seattle Seahawks in 2019. Yes, I think he was better than Jadavian Clowney that year. And I was very excited when Quentin Jefferson joined the Buffalo Bills. I thought that's what you were going to see. That didn't end up panning out, and then he got cut. But one of the reasons I wanted to hang on to Quentin Jefferson is because I thought, hey, there's still something there qualitatively you can do with him. The Bills said, no, 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 no. We'll just get F.A. Obata, and we'll do that with him instead. 
could not be more pleased with some of the new acquisitions you saw on this defensive line. There were a couple of moments of Ed Oliver getting double teamed and blown off the ball a little bit. I think that's going to be something we're going to have to watch. The third year for Ed Oliver, are we going to start to see practice reports about Ed Oliver dominating? Practice reports about Ed Oliver taking it over. Third year, big year for Ed Oliver. Is he going to just be an okay pick? Is he going to be, hey, he's a good player. Nothing flashy. He's just a good, solid player. Are we going to be having the discussions about Ed Oliver at the end of this year? The same way we're having discussions about Tremaine Edmonds. That's a question. Are we going to be having the same, hey, he's good, but he's not what we wanted him to be? Are we going to be having those discussions about Ed Oliver the way we're having them about Tremaine Edmonds? That's something I'm going to be interested to keep my thumb on this year. How the narrative surrounds Ed Oliver and the way it compares to the narrative surrounding Tremaine Edmonds. I got to be honest, guys. I am a big Marvel Cinematic Universe fan. Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is one of my all-time favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. I know it's a hot take. A lot of people are like, Guardians 2? Really? No, I love Guardians 2. Huge fan. First one's good, too. I like the villain and the second one better, and that tips it over. I thought Kurt Russell absolutely slayed it. Chewed the scenery as ego. And I'm telling you this right now. If Gregory Rousseau ends up being really good, there is no limit to the amount of Groot merchandise I will buy. The Bills and Terry Pagula will be able to fund the new $1.4 billion stadium based entirely on Bruce Nolan t-shirt and merchandise purchases. All of their money will come directly from my bank account. It might take a minute. I don't have $1.4 billion, but maybe someone will extend me some credit. I think Basham is an interesting case for this game. I think the fact that Carlos Basham as Bill's fan in Japan says, Carlos Basham playing late into the fourth quarter is fascinating. It's fascinating to me because I was watching him fairly intently. I think Basham meeting with Daryl Johnson at the QB at the end of the third was a really, really, really good play. Basham, as Joe Marino pointed out on Twitter, absolutely loves that spin move. But I think the interesting thing about Basham is when you watch his ability to chain moves together, you know he's a more experienced player. That's one of the things you can tip off. A lot of the narrative coming out of the draft was Carlos Basham might make an earlier impact than Gregory Rousseau. And the reason we said that is because he's more experienced. We didn't say that necessarily because he's more talented physically. It's just because he's more experienced. Where do you see that experience start to show up? I think it's in... The ability of him to chain pass rush moves together, hand usage, counter moves. But playing late into the fourth, I think that's a good thing for rookie. I think it's great, especially for someone who appears to have slipped behind Gregory Rousseau. Let's get in those reps. F.A. Obata was playing right alongside of him, and I thought he played great. So I'm not going to freak out about him playing late into the fourth. I just think it's interesting. Let's move on. Kate and Tom says, Stevenson looked good returning kicks and made clutch plays. Yeah, I thought I looked fine. I thought I looked fine. I wasn't overly, overly impressed with him. I thought he was fine. I think that, I one of the things I think is interesting about Stevenson is I don't see that absolute blistering speed on the field the way that it shows up in athletic testing. He doesn't look like he's moving at a different speed than everyone else. Some players, you watch them, you watch Jalen Waddle in college, for example, and you go, that guy's just moving at a different speed than everyone else. It pops off the television at you. I didn't see that with Stevenson. That doesn't mean he didn't have a reasonable game. He absolutely did. I just thought it was interesting because it's the first time you have them where you know they're going 100% against other people who you also know are going 100%. So I think that matters. All right, let's move on. Wallace Jackson, Dane Jackson missed tackles that Levi didn't on defense, but he did make a good open field tackle on kick coverage. 
I really like the pass breakup by Levi in the end zone. I think he very reasonably could have been flagged for pass interference, but that's completely separate from his ability to get his head around and then his hand up. Tyrell Adams, Tyrell Dodson, Andre Smith. Some backup linebacker stuff going on. How about Andre Smith? Had himself a game, ladies and gentlemen. One of the things I think is interesting is these, these special teams only players that we talk about. Matikavich, Andre Smith, both of them, I think, played pretty well on defense. Joe Miller, host of the Overaction Podcast, DM'd me during the game. He said, hey, maybe we need to talk about Matikavich and him being an absolute liability on defense. Maybe that's not the case. And I, I, I messaged him back and I said, you know, Matikavich was on a 3-4 defense in Pittsburgh. Maybe he's better in a 4-3. He's a little bit of a lighter player. Maybe he needs bodies in front of him on a more consistent basis so he, so he doesn't have to shed the way that you frequently have to do as an inside linebacker in a 3-4 defense. So it's just something to keep an eye on. I think Matikavich was a roster lock anyway, but any benefit you get on defense from Matikavich and Andre Smith is a win. Any benefit you get from them on defense is a win because they already had a leg up due to their special teams. So you should be rooting for Andre Smith and Tyler Matikavich to play well on defense so that you can feel more comfortable carrying them for special teams and not having them be liabilities on defense. Joe Giles Harris, I think, popped a little bit. I, I don't think he's got a significant chance to make this team, but every year there's one. Every year there's one. Last year, there was a backup linebacker who made the team. I had no idea who was going to make it. Now, that was a little different because there was no preseason games, but I thought Joe Giles Harris played well as well in the backup linebacker spot. Let's talk about safeties. Josh Thomas, that trigger versus the run was really, really impressive. I was really happy with what I saw from Josh Thomas today. I think he had a game. Hamlin played well too with a couple big hits, but he whiffed on that fourth down run. Hamlin was hurt late, but he returned. Last safety spot is something to watch. I do think Jaquan Johnson has a really good chance of being the third safety for this team. But that last safety spot between Josh Thomas and DeMar Hamlin, I think that's going to be a discussion. I think it's going to be one of those things you're going to be focused on. And if you're not, you should be. I think Tyler Bass picked up exactly where he left off. Really happy with Tyler Bass. I'll never forget early in 2020, there were some concerns about Tyler Bass. And I tweeted out at the time, it does take time. There is examples of kickers developing. And once they hit their stride, they really have a tendency to stay on that until they get hurt. Injuries to specialists really have a chance to derail what they've got going on. But once you kind of come into your groove as a kicker, you could stay that way for years upon years. Some less than good things. Saran Neal got picked on a little bit. Struggled with some quickness from Amon Ross St. Brown. Struggled with a lot of quickness. I think that the backup corner position is something that's interesting to watch because Saran Neal struggled with quickness. Wild Goose, Rashad Wild Goose got run over for some yak and then he got a pass interference. Then he got burned by Javon McKinley late in the game vertically. Elijah Griffin got completely toasted late off the line by Kennedy for a huge game to put the Lions into field goal range. The Bills' backup corners were not impressive this particular game. I think Sweeney, Tommy Sweeney versus Quentin Morris, I think that was fun. Tommy Sweeney versus Quentin Morris, I think, was a lot of fun. I think whether or not the Bills keep four tight ends or three, I really think they should carry three. I really feel strongly they should carry three. Is going to be really interesting because it ties in with our discussion previously about fullback. If they keep three and a fullback, I won't necessarily be thrilled. I'd love for them to keep three total and no fullback. If you want that third to be Reggie Gilliam, fine. If you want that third to be Tommy Sweeney, fine. But three tight ends and a fullback is probably one roster spot too many for a team that uses 11 and 10 personnel as often as the Buffalo Bills do. I thought Sweeney and Quentin Morris both did a really good job tracking the ball into their hands. Sweeney with some good run after catch. Although I'll level with you on those tight end leaks where it's either split zone with a pop or it's a leak play. 
those things don't mean a ton to me for yards after the catch because you catch it and you're wide open. You're just running straight down the sideline. I think his ability to track the ball into his hands on a throw that wasn't great is far more impressive than the run after catch. So I think that that matters. All right, let's go into the comment section. EB just says from dot, dot, dot. So it's hard for me to evaluate from mostly because Bobby Hart was making it hard for me to evaluate from. I do think that on third downs, he did hold the ball a little bit too long, but I don't really know. I don't really know where the opportunity was for him to make significant plays. When I was watching it back, I would rewind it, watch it back. I didn't see the receivers getting significant separation. And Bobby Hart was doing his best Toro Toro impression on the left side of the line. In addition to Tommy Doyle struggling on the right side of the line. Richard Rush says Knox plays more in the fullback spot than Gilliam. I hope you're right. I don't really want to waste a roster spot on a fullback. If you're only going to use them a couple plays a game. If that's not a big, if that's not a big part of your offense. Now, if you want to have a third tight end also be your fullback, then okay, let's do it. But efficiency in roster spot usage is something notable. MR0381 says, even if Wallace is CB2, we need to do something about our depth. I agree with you. I 100% agree with you. But hey, I've been pounding the table for a new corner discussion pretty much every single year. At some point, they'll do it. At some point, the Bills will draft a corner, and my mentions will absolutely light up. If they draft a corner in the first or second round, anytime in the next couple of years, people are going to go, Bruce, how do you feel? I'm just going to post a picture of Elijah Cuthbert crying and the gif going, it's just so beautiful. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be amazing. Justin comes in. Bruce, thank you for all your diligence. I listen to you religiously. Don't you dare stop or I might have to come to Ohio. Justin, I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Jeff says, Webb's mobility impressed me. I agree. With the uh, the quarterback draw out of the so- shotgun, I thought it was so fun. I was laughing. I looked at my wife and I said, that's the Josh Allen special. All those races they've done in practice are paying off. Josh is like, no, 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 no. Let me, let me show you how to run this. Let me show you how to run this. You come, you plant your back foot, and then you go. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Vivek SM says, Zimmer, question mark. I did not make any notes on Justin Zimmer, which means he didn't flash negatively for me and he didn't flash positively for me. Now, I may have to go back and watch, which I probably will before I do the podcast next week, but nothing showed up on my notes. And given how many notes I had, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not necessarily a good thing either. Trey says, did we see any loose the goose? I made a note on Rashad Wild Goose. I do not think... It was an overly impressive, auspicious debut for Rashad Wild Goose. MR asks, what are your thoughts on Basham playing that late into the game? I mentioned I'm trying not to make too much of it. I don't really need to make too much of it, um, mostly because I really think that he needs the reps. I think if he's going to be a big part of this team on a versatile space, then I think more reps is better than less reps. One of the things we need to talk about is if you're going to be a player who plays multiple positions and you're a developing player, you need more total reps because each rep you get at one position is one less total rep you're getting in a different position. If you want someone to play left end, right end, and kick inside, you probably need to give them more reps than if you just have them rushing from right end. And that's it. Vinny T in the comments says, speaking of merch, I want my McDermott slash Josh Allen floppy hat. Absolutely. I need a floppy hat. Only the two of them could take floppy hats and make them look good. Only them. I could not pull off the floppy hat. A hundred percent could not pull off the floppy hat. Ladies and gentlemen, we did it. We did the thing. 35 minutes of nonstop. Well, I mean, you know, stop for a commercial break. If you're listening to this as a podcast, nonstop instant Bruce reactions. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate it. I enjoyed most of it. I will level 
I was a little bit nervous, not going to lie. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for your engagement. And until next time, that's the way the cookie crumbles. I'm Bruce Nolan, Buffalo Rumblings.